Okay, good morning, everyone. You made it. It's the end of the beginning. Hopefully, all of you finished assignment 10. Yes, no? Awesome. Okay, I'll take that as a yes. Everyone finished all five differentiable assignments? Grad students? Almost, not quite. Okay, you got one more day to work on that. Almost there. Okay. As you were coding up the evolutionary algorithms and maybe refactoring the quadruped and possibly struggling with gradients in the fifth and final differentiable assignment, it occurred to you to ask, what would happen if we mutated two synaptic weights rather than one? What would happen if the motors were a little bit stronger, a little bit weaker? What would happen if my quadruped had two extra legs and was a hexapod rather than a quadruped? We've been evolving the robot to walk. What would happen if we evolved the robot to jump or climb up stairs or navigate over rough terrain? What would happen if, what would happen if, what would happen if you now have one month to try and figure it out? So hopefully uh, by the end of assignment 10, you now have a relatively stable code base on which you can conduct some evolutionary robotics experiments. With the fifth and final differentiable assignment, hopefully you have a relatively firm foundation in which to try and optimize the body and or brains of robots in a non-random way. So what we're gonna do today, probably we're gonna take most of this morning, is to actually walk through what the expectations are for the final project. And I will try to give you a good sense of what works and what doesn't work for a final project but that's only advice. The final project is in your hands. So obviously you've got a lot of room to maneuver. You can come up with an idea of your own, but we wanna make sure you come up with an idea that's doable um, in a month's time. I understand that some of you have some other things going on in other classes as well. Yeah, I realize it's a busy time of year. It's a tricky time of year to summon enough focus and willpower to come up with a scientific question and try and test it with your code base, but we'll do the best we can. Okay, so I'm gonna go over a lot of material today. I'm sure there will be more questions that arise about the final project uh, over the uh, final month of the course. So I will set aside a few minutes at the beginning of every class from now until the end of the semester to field questions about final projects, to clarify any things, anything as we go. Any questions so far? So far, so good. Okay, so you will see that on today now you are being assigned the very first of your weekly reports. So you're no longer submitting screenshots and videos demonstrating that you've uh, completed assignments. You are going to continue to submit on Brightspace screenshots and videos demonstrating that you're making progress towards your final project. That's the weekly report. So. All of you now, whether you're taking this class for undergraduate or graduate credit, at 11.59 p.m. next Monday, uh, eclipse or no eclipse, you're gonna be submitting a demonstration to us. You're gonna show us that you've made some progress towards your final project. And we'll talk about what these weekly reports look like in a moment. Okay, so if you click on through to uh, the first weekly report, it will take you to Brightspace and you will find, as always, something that is due next Monday at 11.59 p.m. Exactly what is due is described in this Google Doc here, which if you click on it, will bring you to the Evolutionary Robotics Final Project Instruction. This document is almost two pages long. My apologies, we're gonna read through it from top to bottom this morning, just so we're all literally and metaphorically on the same page, okay? All right, so um, undergraduate students, you've got three options for your final project. There is a list of pre-formulated projects. These are ideas that uh, some former students and I came up with that are reasonable. They're things that are doable in about a month's time, assuming you were relatively successful implementing all 10 assignments. We've broken, as you'll see, if you click through to this list, you'll see that some of these projects have an easy label attached to them and some of them have a hard label attached to them. 
for obvious reasons. Some are easier than others. You can pick one of those from the list, or you can define, d uh, devise a final project of your own. Read through that list, and it'll give you sort of a sense of what's possible, and you should be able to come up with an idea of your own. OK, for those taking the course for graduate credit, you do need to come up with an idea of your own. OK, if you choose your own idea, it must involve modifying the code base somehow, either the code base from assignments 1 through 10 or the code base from the differentiable assignments 1 through 5. For the, those taking it for grad credit, we don't mind. You can modify A10 or D5 to suit your final project idea. Fine with us. OK. Uh, I, I'd prefer that rather than you coding up something from scratch. It's much easier to go awry if you're sort of starting over from scratch. I don't advise trying to create your own physics engine and then do something interesting with it in a month's time. So your own idea, but using the code base that you currently have. Okay. Final project ideas using the differentiable assignment code base are here. I forgot to put a link to here. Those taking this for graduate credit, if you go back to the diff design wiki page at the bottom now there's a list of some final project ideas things you can do with the differentiable simulator okay i'll put the link back here later okay all right there are four mondays remaining in the semester you're going to use this time to devise and implement in four increments four weekly in increments your final project Okay, how do you decide on whether you want to do an easy or hard project? If you found you were struggling with the programming assignments, I recommend the easy, an easy project. If you want to try something more challenging, go with the hard one. You will not be penalized if you choose the easy uh, project. Okay, uh, if you want to try an idea of your own, please email Freya or myself so we can basically just sign off or give you some suggestions about how, how to either reel it back in if we feel it's a little bit too ambitious. If it sounds like something that could be done in about a week or two weeks time, we'll suggest maybe some ways to elaborate or enrich your final project idea. Okay. What you need to do between now uh, and Monday is think up a final project and then think how to break it down into four bite-sized chunks, or at least weekly chunks. For each of those four imp uh, increments, you also need to think about how you're going to demonstrate it to us with a couple of screenshots or a video. As always, we're not going to have a look at any code. You got to try and make things easy on us, where we can relatively easily see in your screenshot or a video that you're making progress on your final project. Okay, so what you're gonna do in the next week is write out those four milestones, and they all have to be about a sentence or two, no paragraphs, no essays, keep it, keep it short and simple. Write out these milestones and a sentence, or even half a sentence on what your planned visualizations are to demonstrate that you've completed that milestone. So here's an example. Okay, if you click through to the link above, you're gonna see a long list of projects. One of those projects is the Up, Up, and Away project, which is to modify your code base so that instead of evolving for forward locomotion, you're evolving for jumping. Jumping sounds like a trivial thing. Has anybody tried to evolve jumping yet in their robot? I can guarantee you it's not a trivial thing to do. Okay, so um, this is me writing as if I was the student. If you copy, if you write something along these lines and drop it into milestone one by next Monday night, that's, that's good. So I would like to implement the up, up and away project where I'm gonna evolve my robot to jump. In order to evolve it to jump, I'm gonna modify simulate.py so that when the simulation of each robot ends, simulate.py is going to write out not a single floating point number, which is how far forward the robot traveled, but instead the file is going to write out all of the touch sensor values for the four feet of my robot in a binary matrix. So we're going to have a whole bunch of columns in this matrix which correspond to each time step of the simulation. Each of the four rows in this binary matrix are going to correspond to the four feet in my robot. I haven't put those details into my description. That's kind of too much detail for Freya and I, but this is sort of how you want to be thinking over the next week. 
Okay, I'm going to write out all of these numbers. They're all plus ones and minus ones, whether or not that foot is in contact with the ground for each time step of the simulation. And I'm going to write that, I'm going to have simulate.py write that out to a file when it ends, rather than what it currently does, which is to write out the distance traveled by the robot. So far, so good? Okay. Uh, there we go. Okay, sorry, I should have said I will include a screenshot of simulate.py writing out this matrix. So perhaps in this first week, you might not even have a simulation going yet, but you're, you're going to demonstrate your code doing something like, for example, writing out a matrix to a file. You can just record your screen, make a, short, a screenshot or a short video of simulate.py ending you double click on a file, that file opens and we see a whole bunch of ones and zeros, right? 10 second video or a couple of screenshots shows us that your code is doing what you wanted it to do by the end of this first week. Show, don't tell. Any questions about that? Seem reasonable? Okay. Second milestone, what am I gonna do in the second week? Okay, so now simulate.py is writing out this matrix, now I'm going to switch from simulate.py back to the search process, the evolutionary algorithm. So in the second week, I'm going to modify search.py so that it reads in this binary matrix when simulate.py ends. And it's going to boil down that matrix to a single floating point number. We're going to apply our fitness function to this matrix, and the fitness function is going to spit out a floating point number. Okay, what seems reasonable? I want this robot to jump, so if a robot or a human is jumping, their, their feet are in contact with the ground for as little time as possible. So I'm going to compute in search.py a fitness function, which just counts the number of minus ones in the matrix. If you modified your parallel hill climber that's in search.py to evolve that, what are you going to get, do you think? If you evolve with that fitness function for the quadruped, what is the evolved quadruped likely going to be doing at the end of search.py? Try to get as many things off the ground as possible. Okay, so probably going to get jumping. Probably more like balancing on two legs. Balancing on two legs or tap dancing. Even with something simple like jump uh, jumping, you're unlikely to get what you want. You may not know that in advance, but this is what I want you to try and think about over the next week. You're all becoming experts on running evolutionary robotics experiments or seeing a whole bunch of them up here at the front and what works and what doesn't work. You can almost run this idea in your head, right? You imagine running the parallel hill climber and it's evolving controllers for the quadruped and the quadruped is evolving to generate more and more minus ones, thanks to the fitness function. Does that always mean jumping? What would be some easier ways for it to do that? You may or may not be right in your predictions, but I want you to try and come up with a plan. And if you don't get, if you think there's a, there's an, a, a chance of perverse instantiation. You're not going to get what you want. What are you going to do in the third week to try and guard against it or, or improve or help with whatever it is you want your robot to do? So uh, this hypothetical student here is thinking this through and says this will lead to the evolution of robots that keep as many feet off the ground as possible, which is not necessarily jumping. And I'm going to show that to you all with a video. So that's the plan for, for the second week. Plan for the second week is I'm going to modify the fitness function to compute the number of consecutive time steps in which the robot keeps all of its feet off the ground. Right? So clearly the student has thought a little bit about what might go wrong and has come up with a different fitness function they're going to try out in week three that more explicitly asks for exactly what you want which is not just to keep feet off the ground, but to keep all the feet off the ground for as many time steps as possible. 
Okay, um, I'm gonna implement that, I'm gonna rerun my code, and then I will demonstrate with a video that this causes the robot to jump and stay in the air as long as possible. So this hypothetical student who wants to evolve a robot to jump has sort of sketched out what they plan to do over the next three weeks that they hope will lead at the end of the third week to what they want. What are you gonna do with your fourth week? In your fourth week, you're gonna be doing what's called A-B testing. And we'll talk a little bit about A-B testing first before we talk about this fourth deliverable. Anybody heard of A-B testing before? Anybody ever visited a website and then come back a week later and it looks a little bit different, the font's a little bit different, the color's a little bit different? That's whoever makes the website subjecting you to A-B testing. You create a website, uh, you create two slightly different versions of the website with slightly different fonts, and when any person arrives at your website, you flip a coin, heads they see version A of your website, tails they see version B of your website. Next user comes, flip another coin, A, B, A, B, and this company over a week's time starts to collect a whole bunch of web traffic data about people landing on version A or version B of their site and doing whatever they want to do. And at the end of the week, the user interface members of the company have to decide, are they gonna move forward with just version A or version B of the website? How do they decide? They've got all this raw web traffic data, version A, version B of their website. What's the test? If you're the company, what are you hoping for? They'll call you or buy your product. Or the, how many people actually click through to buy your product? How much time did people spend on the site? If you're able to detect whether the user that landed on your website was a bot or a human, maybe A gets rid of bots quicker than version B does. There's lots of different metrics you could come up with where you apply that metric to the web data you have for version A and version B, and you're looking to see whether that metric is different between A and B. If more people buy products when they land on B rather than A, throw away A and, and version B becomes your website. This is very standard practice in engineering, software engineering, web design, and it turns out robotics as well. So, at the end of week three, this hypothetical student is hopeful that they now have an evolutionary system in which they can evolve jumping, but they're now going to come up with variant A or version A of their code base and version B of their code base in this fourth week and evolve robots slightly differently in these two versions of their code and they want to see which one works better. Which one actually leads to better jumping in this case? So this student proposes to us, here's how they're gonna to start to do A-B testing. I'm gonna modify my, the simulation side of my code again to write out not just the touch sensor data like I've been doing over the last three weeks, but I'm also gonna go back to writing out the horizontal distance that the robot travels which is what simulate.py currently does at the end of assignment 10. Okay, so now at the end of every simulation, they have distance traveled by the robot and this binary touch sensor uh, data set. They're gonna compute fitness now as D times T inside of search.py. They're, they're proposing to modify their fitness function yet again, where D is the horizontal distance traveled by the robot, and the, the consecutive number of time steps, consecutive number of time steps that all feet are off the ground. So if you did evolve the quadruped with this fitness function, what kind of behavior do you think you're gonna get? You're trying to maximize D, distance traveled, and maximize T, the number of consecutive time steps with all feet off the ground, what are we evolving for? Pretty long jumping. 
long jumping, right? You remember the Olympics theme song where I showed you some of the final projects from last year? So now they can start to change the fitness function to select for different kinds of jumping. So now they're going to evolve for long jumping. And they're going to then compare evolving for the standing jump, which is what they did in the third milestone. They were just evolving at the end of the third week for number of time steps off the ground. And they, that's their version A. And version B is they can evolve for long jumping. So A, evolve for high jumping. B, evolve for long jumping. And which of these two versions, A or B, produces better jumping? Hard to say, because a standing jump and a long jump are just different kind of jumps. For this student, they want to just see which of these two versions, A or B, causes the robot to jump as high as possible. There's nothing that necessarily says the standing jump or the long jump will produce a higher Y component, a more positive or negative Y component. They want to compare these two versions of their code. Seems like kind of an arbitrary choice, but that's OK in the final project. Yeah? You're trying out two different ways of doing things. Yeah? Another, another way they might have gone, so uh, third milestone, I'm going, to evolve, I'm going to evolve a standing jump. And in the fourth milestone, I'm going to evolve standing jump with a low mutation rate. Every child uh, suffers a change to one synaptic wave. That's version A, which is what you already have. Version B, I'm going to increase the mutation rate. Whenever a child is produced, I'm going to allow one, two, or three synapses to suffer a random change. Maybe it's easier to evolve jumping if more things can change between parent-child, parent-child, parent-child than less things. You can make arguments for or against a higher mutation rate. It's not clear. So for that student, that becomes A or B. Any questions so far? This is obviously a hypothetical example, but just to give you a sense of what we're looking for. OK, so what we want you to submit by next Monday night is exactly, is exactly this, a write-up of these four things, which is your plan for the next month. And we want you to include your evidence that you've done the first part. Seem reasonable? OK. An obvious question that might be occurring to you is, what happens if your plan changes, right? What happens if at the end of week two, you actually do get jumping exactly as you wanted, right? Good for you. You're done two weeks early. Afraid not. Change your plan. When you submit, when you submit your second milestone, leave a note to us. Here was my original plan for week three and week four, but I managed to accomplish my goal early, so now I'm going to try some other things. Right? Or, I didn't accomplish my goal. Things turned out to be even harder than I thought. So here's my revised plan for week three and week four. It's OK with us if you change your baby steps, your four baby steps that you're taking towards your final project. It's also OK as, as you go from week to week, maybe your ideas change about what you want to do. As long as you tell us, this was my plan last week, this is my new plan, and I've got a new plan. I know what I'm doing over the next two weeks. As long as you do that, no problem. Yeah. OK. OK, so again, by next Monday night, uh, by next Monday night, you're going to be telling us what you're going to do, your four milestones, and a link to some proof that you actually implemented it. There's one other thing you need to do. You need to do a little bit of housekeeping. There's a couple of minor things that need to be fixed in your code base. These are things that are going to cause you a bit of a headache if you don't fix them before you start modifying your code base for the final project. Shouldn't take you long. You don't even need to show us any evidence that you did it. I just recommend that you fix these few things. Okay. Following Monday, the 15th, you complete your second milestone. Uh, you complete your, your second milestone and tell us your four milestones again. So here's what I did last week. Here's what I did this week. Here's my modified plan for week three, week four, and proof of milestone two. 
Same thing for the Monday after that, proof of milestone three. And, uh, and in the last week uh, of classes, you're going to be showing us preliminary results from your A-B testing. Here's a video of my high jump. Here's a video of my robot doing the long jump. And as you can see just by eye, by looking at these two videos, the robot that did the long jump actually got higher than the one that did the standing jump. That's preliminary results of your A-B test. We get what your A and B is, and you're pointing to us something in a short video or a couple of screenshots. We can see the thing that you're comparing between your two variations. Any questions about that? OK. All right. Uh, sorry, that's not, the, that's not the last week. That's the penultimate week of the semester. The last week of the semester, you're going to be submitting materials, uh, a written report, and an oral presentation. This is a short YouTube video that you'll be presenting during the exam period, which is the following day, Tuesday, May the 7th. So what you're going to be submitting uh, the night of May 6th and what we're going to be doing in class here on the morning of Tuesday, May 7th, we'll talk about later. We're not quite there yet. I want you to just focus on these four milestones for the next month or so. All good? Okay. All right. The thing you probably really want to know, your final project, if you may recall, is worth 30%. I've broken this into 16% for your four weekly milestones and 14% for what you're submitting the final Monday night and what you're doing in class Tuesday morning during the exam period. 16% for the four weekly milestones, so 4% each, more or less like the 10 assignments. All good? Okay, ah, I guess that's it. Okay, so what I would suggest you do is when you get some time, go and have a look at this list. I might go through this list next time we meet in class and uh, I can point out a few things about some of those easy and hard projects. All good? Okay. All right, good luck with ideation this week. All right, back to lecture material. We're talking about open problems in the field, things for which no one has a good answer for yet. Maybe some of you might come up with a good answer. We're working our way through trying to cross the reality gap, arguably the hardest and the least well-solved problem in robotics in general. AI designs a robot in simulation and we try and realize it in the real world and it doesn't work. We fail to cross the reality gap. First idea, sprinkle some noise in the simulation. That tends to help. Second idea, connect a physics engine to a 3D printer and just print as many evolved robots as you can with the hope that at least one of them crosses the gap. And we started last time by talking about my own humble attempt to try and solve this problem. The idea behind the Resilient Machines project is don't just evolve robots in a, in a physics engine. Evolve the physics engine also to more closely match the reality of wherever your evolved robot is going to end up. So as we'll see in a moment when we return to the Resilient Machines project, the Resilient Machines is not just about sim to real, evolving in simulation and transferring to reality. There is also real to sim. We have a physical robot that's moving around in its environment. It's collecting intel. It's collecting data about what works and what doesn't work in reality. And it's sending that data back. And that raw material is being used to evolve simulators or physics engines to more closely match the physical robot and its surroundings. That's the basic intuition behind the Resilient Machines project. OK. Okay, so I think we got to here last time. Forget about the EEA, this was this clunky name. We'll call it the Resilient Machines Project from here on out. In the Resilient Machines Project, unlike anything you've seen in this class so far, there is not just one evolutionary algorithm at work. There are one, two, three evolutionary algorithms at work. The first 
evolutionary algorithm is going to be evolving populations of simulators. We talked about what would be an obvious fitness function or fitness, what would be the fitness of any given simulator in that population? What makes for a better or worse simulator? What makes for a bad simulator? Low fitness. Absolutely. The fitness function, as you'll see in a moment, is going to measure how well the simulator matches reality. So we've got one evolutionary algorithm that's evolving populations of simulators. We have a, let me skip to the third one for a moment, come back to the second one. The third one should look very familiar to you. This is an evolutionary algorithm that's evolving a useful controller for a robot in a simulator but it's not an off-the-shelf simulator. It's evolving uh, robot controllers in the evolved simulator, the evolved simulator, singular, not plural. We have a whole population of simulators here. Which one do we choose from this population of evolving simulators in which to evolve simulated robots for those robots to do whatever we want them to do, as we usually do? You've got a whole choice. You've got a whole population of evolved simulators. One the, highest fitness. the one with highest fitness. Let's be optimists and assume that the one that has highest fitness is the most accurate reflection of reality. So that's the one we should use for evolving robot controllers. So far, so good. Two evolutionary algorithms, one evolving simulators, the other evolving virtual robots in a simulator, the best one from this population. Question. What varies between the simulators? Yeah, we haven't said that yet. I'm trying to give you a 10,000 foot view of how this works. We're going to dive down into each of these three evolutionary algorithms in a moment. OK, the third one, this is a little trickier. Uh, we're going to use a third evolutionary algorithm that's going to evolve controllers for the robot so that when the physical robot uses one of the controllers from this third evolutionary algorithm, that physical robot is going to liberate or discover new information about the world. It's going to act in a way in reality that provides new raw material for this one. This is a little trickier. So we, I mentioned here curiosity. If you're learning an instrument, or you're learning a sport, or you're learning a new branch of mathematics, once you start to get a little bit of the basics down, you might try some stuff out. What would happen if? Yeah? Get some new information from the world. Okay. We'll come back to this third evolutionary algorithm towards the end of this lecture, but I want you to focus on these two for a moment. The shorthand for the first evolutionary algorithm is the estimator. It's the thing that's trying to estimate reality. That's what a, that's what a physics engine does. It doesn't reflect reality, as you all now probably know full well. It estimates. It's not perfect, right? The second evolutionary algorithm I'll refer to as the exploiter. It's going to try and exploit one of these evolved simulators to get the behavior that we want for our robot. Right? We're trying to exploit this evolved simulator to do some useful work, which is to evolve a robot that does useful work for us in reality. The third one we're going to call exploration. Because when this evolutionary algorithm gives a controller to the physical robot, the physical robot is going to do something new in the world to explore its world and get some new information back for the simulators. Everybody get this so far? All right. OK, so here we go. We're going to walk through the next 12 slides or so a one run of the Resilient Machines project. You're going to see how these three evolutionary algorithms uh, fit together. 
So we're going to start with a physical robot. We already have our physical robot. It's this one. And you'll see a video of it uh, in a moment. We don't know how to control it. NASA wants to send this to an extraplanetary body and have it move across the surface of that extraplanetary body. It's not quite clear how it should, should move. It's even more not clear how it should move if something unexpected happens to this machine. Yeah? OK, so we have this physical robot. We're going to start by giving this physical robot a little bit of information, which is we're going to tell it that at least at the beginning, to the best of our knowledge, you are made up of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine parts. This physical robot uh, does not have a camera on board. It cannot see its own body. It doesn't know. We're just giving a, a little bit of information. This robot has no idea how all these parts are put together. This robot, or really the evolutionary algorithm, is going to discover how all these nine pieces are fit together. It's going to construct this evolutionary algorithm. is going to estimate or construct or discover how all these parts are put together. Here we go. OK. So at the very beginning of this project, the robot, the physical robot, doesn't know how to move. It knows it's got nine parts, doesn't know how they fit together, has absolutely no information. Where should it start? Best thing to do is probably to start in real. The robot's going to do something to generate a little bit of data in the real world. And we're going to feed that small bit of real data back in to start evolving the simulators to explain that small bit of information from the real world. If you're this robot, or you're a baby, you don't know much about your own body, you don't know how it works, what would you do? It's not a rhetorical question. What would you do? You probably did do this way back at the beginning, you just don't remember. Move just move around. Just do something at random. OK. <laughs> Which is exactly what this robot does. Does this robot look familiar? Radially symmetric quadruped? Yeah. OK, so we've got these nine parts. As you can see, it's got these four legs radially arranged around its body. Each leg has a shoulder and a knee. The shoulder and the knee each have one degree of freedom. So the robot knows it's got nine parts, and it knows it has eight motors. At this point, the robot has randomly chosen to rotate motors one and five, sorry, one in five, one in five down, and rotate all the others up. Ah. Why can I not run this now? We had it. OK. As I mentioned, this robot has no camera on board. So it can't see what its body looks like, and it can't see how its body moves. This robot has only two sensors on board. It's got two vestibular sensors. You also have two vestibular sensors. Where are they? Right? So this robot has two vestibular sensors in its main body here. And these two vestibular sensors tell it how it can move, how much it's rotating left and right, how much the main body is tilting left and right, and how much the main body is tilting forward and back. So at the end of this, what is this, five second uh, experience in the real world, the robot has run some random controller, and it's gotten back at the end of these five seconds two floating point numbers, how much it's tilted left or right, and how much it's tilted forward or back. OK, I want you to try and put yourself in the shoes of this robot. I lock you in a big metal box. And in front of you, inside that metal box, are eight levers where you can pull some of those levers. You pull lever one and lever five, and suddenly you feel yourself tilt to the right. What do you conclude? You're sitting inside a machine. What can you conclude about that machine? You've pulled motor one and five down, and you've tilted to the right. What does that mean? What does that tell you? It doesn't tell you much. It tells you a little bit of information. 
Any ideas? The left side of my body. The left side of my body is moving up, and I'm tilting to the right. So if I pulled motors one and five down, and the left side of my body went up, then where must motors one and five be? I pulled motors one and five down. They're on my left side somewhere. Yeah, so we've got a little bit of sensory motor information from the real world. The motor information is one and five down, and the resulting sensory information is I tilt 30 degrees to the right. Everybody see that? That's the kind of sensory motor information this robot is able to get from the real world. Okay. It's not a lot of information, so this robot could start pulling other levers and doing all sorts of things. But remember, we're doing this project for NASA, and this makes NASA very, very nervous. This robot has high uncertainty, not, even, not just about even where it is, but how it's even put together. It knows very little. If you know very little or you're uncertain, stay still, do nothing, try a few things, and then see if you can make sense of that little bit of information that you get. Maybe the robot's sit sitting on the lip of a massive crater and one more pull of the lever and that's it for 10 billion taxpayer dollars. Yeah, very, very gentle and slow. So now we've just visited real, we're gonna do real to sim. This robot is gonna stop moving and it's gonna communicate by Bluetooth with an off-board computer, and it's gonna send that information, and we're gonna start up the first of the three evolutionary algorithms, which is gonna to start to evolve simulators, which for the moment is the simulated robot. I mentioned earlier that we're evolving the physics engine as a whole, that's a bit of an approximation. U ultimately, that's what this project does, but for our purposes, let's assume that we have a base layer of a physics engine, but we're not quite sure how to construct our robot in that physics engine. So we're evolving these virtual robots in an underlying simulator. So far, so good? Okay, what's happening? As always, I'm showing you a video that's taking some snapshots over evolutionary time. When I shot this video almost 20 years ago now, I wasn't very good at controlling the virtual camera inside the physics engine. So I want you to mentally rotate the virtual camera and imagine the virtual camera is here and pointing to the robot here. Virtual camera's over here, it's pointing at the robot here. What's happening? What's the virtual robot evolving to do? It's trying to mimic what the real robot did, which was the real robot just tilted 30 degrees to the right. So my apologies. If the virtual camera was here pointing here, you'd see that this green block starts to rotate 30 degrees to the right. Everybody see that? Okay, so over this short snippet, you're seeing the most fit simulator in the population of evolving simulators over about half an hour running on a 2003 desktop computer. And you can see that the estimation algorithm, the algorithm that's evolving these simulators, is getting more accurate. It's matching, it's matching the physical robot. You'll notice that the robot is discovering there's lots of different ways it can put all these nine pieces together and explain or match that real data. There isn't just one virtual body that causes the robot to rotate 30 degrees to the right. There's lots of them. What does the robot conclude at this point? You're an infant. You don't know much about your body. You've done something. Your visual system hasn't developed very well yet. You feel yourself rock to the right. You start thinking in your head about how all your body parts might be put together. And you can come up with lots of different theories that explain the data. 
Maybe I'm put together like this. Maybe I'm put together like that. What do you conclude? You might be doing this subliminally. You don't know you're doing this, but what do you conclude? Lots of different body plans explain the same data set. We got a problem. We need more data because they can't all be right. I don't yet know how my body's put together, but I can't be a snake. I can't be a linear arrangement of nine parts and a quadruped and a biped simultaneously. I can't be all these things. Whatever I am, I'm only one thing, so I need more data. So we've gone from real to sim. Now we're going to go back to real. OK. So we go back to this robot, and this time, I don't know why we're having a problem with videos here. OK. We go back to Sim, and this time the robot does this. Now the robot is pulling some other levers down and letting the other ones rotate up. And this time, the robot tilts 10 degrees to the left. So now the physical robot has two pieces of data from the real world. One in five down, tilt 30 degrees to the right, rotate seven down, seven down, and now I tilt 10 degrees to the left. What do you think the robot does at this point? It's got several ideas about how it's put together, several ideas that explain that first piece of data. Now it's got two pieces of data. What does the robot do next, do you think? Does it narrow down the possibilities from the first, first uh, simulation to say, oh, it can't be this, this, or this, because when I moved like this, it didn't go in circles, or it did go in this circle. Absolutely. It's going to narrow down. It's going to narrow down its possibilities. How is it going to narrow down its possibilities? Exactly. Can we be a little bit more specific? How does it know? Possibly, right? That's an explanation, but how does it get to that explanation? How did it make the leap that you just made? Just run the motor, and then if it does the 10 degrees of right. The motor of which body plan? Remember, we have several different ones. All of them. All of them? OK. So we run all of them. Remember, we have this population of virtual body plans. We run each of them with this new plan. Rotate motor seven down. Motor seven is going to be at different places on these different bodies. So now all those different bodies are going to rotate in different ways. We need to recompute the fitness of all of those current virtual bodies that we have. How does the fitness change for all of those virtual bodies that we have in the population? All of them, by definition, explain the first action. We've just supplied all of them with this second action, rotate motor seven down. How does fitness change for these bodies? Which, which do well and which do not do well? Absolutely. If in those virtual bodies, one of them actually manages to rotate 10 degrees, that one gets to continue to enjoy high fitness, and the fitness of all the others drops because they all explained the first action, or they could replicate the first action in simulation, but they couldn't replicate the repercussions of the second action. So their fitnesses drop, and this one, just by chance, is now more fit than everyone else in the population. Everybody see that so far? If I lost anyone? OK. What's the chance that among all those bodies, there was one, or at least one that happened to also describe 
perfectly this second action that actually did rotate 10 degrees to the left. Probably not very likely. Why should they? They, own, they were evolved to explain the first action. Mother Nature is a satisficer, not an optimizer. She explained very well. She came up with a whole bunch of different body plans that explained action one. No reason why they would explain action two. So likely, the fitnesses of all of them would drop. What do we do now? This seems problematic. We now have a whole bunch of virtual bodies that have low fitness. They're not explaining real very well. well. What do we do? You're a baby. You know nothing about your body. You do something. You update your ideas about how you're put together that explain that action. Now you've done something else. And suddenly, oh, all the ideas you had, what do you do? Try again. You could try again. But you have this new piece of information that's unexplained so far. You could go get another piece. Dangerous, whether you're a baby or a rover sitting on an unknown surface. What do you do? You have a whole bunch of ideas about your body that explain the first action, but not the second. Generate new ideas. Generate new ideas. We just continue the first evolutionary algorithm. Keep evolving bodies. I'm not having much luck with my videos this morning. Which is a shame, because we have a lot of them. OK, so what you're going to see in a moment, eventually, is you're going to see the first evolutionary algorithm that's evolving these virtual bodies just keep going. Question? Yeah, why, why choose to start evolution from you know, just sort of the set of parts of the body and not give it sort of the basic architecture of the body? Great question. Why didn't we just tell it how it's put together? Or vaguely. Vaguely, yeah. How long did it take many of you to build the quadruped in the 10th assignment? Maybe not too long. Got to figure out joint normals, joint ranges, body parts. That's for a robot made up of eight, nine parts and eight joints. The rovers that are up on Mars at the moment have uh, upwards of 3,000 moving components. It is not trivial even to make an approximation. So one of the things we wanted to just try in this experiment was how little a priori information could you give this algorithm for it to reconstruct a simulation of the robot. You're right, in this simple case, we probably could have just given it to it. We wanted to see how well it could do. OK, so at this point in the experiment, we started in real. We bounced back to sim, back to real for a second time. <laughs> We're now back at sim a second time. So what happens in the Resilient Machines project is we go back and forth real sim, sim to real, real to sim, sim to real. What you're watching in this actual video is not the second attempt at sim. This is actually the eighth attempt. We'd be here all day if we went through a whole bunch of these. So you'll have to bear with me. We've jumped ahead. At this point, the physical robot has carried out eight actions. And at the start of this video, the robot has a whole bunch of different bodies. It's got a whole bunch of different bodies like these that explain the seven actions, but don't explain the eighth one. They all fail terribly on the eighth one. At the end of this video, after we've continued to run this evolutionary algorithm that's evolving these simulators, we now have body plans that explain all eight actions. Why am I skipping ahead to the eighth one? There's something that happened during this eighth attempt that made a big difference. What's happening? We've got data from all the others. Uh, good point. We, um, I think that's actually true. 
Now, it wasn't that it tried the first motor on attempt one, motor two on the second attempt, but just by chance on this eighth attempt, I think now it has sufficient data from all the motors and enough combinations so that what happens? What does the robot discover during this eighth attempt to evolve descriptions of itself? You have four legs with two sections of these. Absolutely. So this is the moment during this particular evolutionary trial, this experiment, in which the robot had its eureka moment. Up until this point, it says, there's, I can imagine lots of different ways of putting together my nine parts that explain all seven actions. But now with this eight, eighth action, suddenly there appears in the population one simulation, and you're gonna see it briefly in a moment, in which the robot gets three out of the four legs right, and that suddenly explains like seven and a half actions. It's suddenly starting to understand everything that's been happening. Seven and a half, and then a few more mutations, a couple more generations of this evolutionary algorithm evolve that three-legged robot into a four-legged robot. And this one suddenly starts to explain all eight actions. When we run all eight of those controllers on that last virtual robot, that virtual robot tilts in all the ways that the physical robot tilted during those eight actions. So are you testing on all the actions? Absolutely. So every time, as we're running this evolutionary algorithm, fitness tends to drop. Things get harder and harder because each individual virtual robot has to explain every physical action. At this point in the experiment, we have eight pieces of data from the real world, so we have to evaluate each virtual robot eight times. We rotate motor one and five down, then rotate motor seven down, and we see how the virtual robot does in all of those eight cases. Yeah? You, and the fitness function is measuring how well do you do at explaining or tilting the same way the physical robot did in all those eight trials. Uh, good point. Uh, boy, this is 20 years ago now. We multiplied the tilts together, right? So it has to do well at all of them. So you said goes up, goes down, goes down. So if we imagine at the beginning when we were running sim the very first time, fitness went up, 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 up because it was relatively easy for the evolutionary algorithm to evolve bodies that tilted 30 degrees to the right. No sweat. Easy. Evolution made easy progress. We got this second piece of data Suddenly, everyone in the population could not explain the second, so everybody dropped. But a little bit more slowly this time, fitness started to rise again as we kept running this evolutionary algorithm. And finally, we started to get bodies that could explain both experiences from the real world. Up, down, up, down. During this eighth trial, down, 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 up, up. Four legs. Okay. We let this experiment continue. Here's the robot. We're going to skip ahead now. This is the 16th trial. This is the physical robot performing its 16th action. And in this case, it just happens to rotate motors in this way. We take that 16th piece from real and go back to sim. What do you think is happening at sim at this point? At this point in SIM, we still have a population of virtual bodies that are all good at explaining all previous 15 actions. And now it's got a 16th one. What do you think is happening at this point? They're all still good. If I can play this. Ah. Apologies. This is what's happening in the evolutionary process. The evolutionary algorithm saying, no problem. You keep throwing, you keep giving me more and more information from the real world, and 
nothing is changing in the evolutionary algorithm. We have this very highly fit body plan, and it looks, all of the body plans in this population, they all look like this. They're all explaining the data. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, no drop in fitness. This particular body plan continues to describe everything that's coming in from the physical robot. What can the robot conclude at this point? Remember, the robot has no camera. It can't see itself. But what can the robot conclude now? We do another 16 actions, 32, no change. They're all, every virtual robot in the population is a radially symmetric four-legged robot. It's converged. The robot says, I know, I look like this. I can't actually see myself, but I've indirectly inferred my reality. This is it. This is how I'm put together. The robot now has, the physical robot now has high certainty. It knows how it's put together. Great, okay. We haven't even started the NASA, NASA mission yet, right? This is just tuning up or evolving a simulation of the physical robot. So now we start up the second evolutionary algorithm, which you're more familiar with, is just going to evolve populations of neural controllers for this robot, the one that just evolved. So far, so good? OK. I won't even bother talking much about this uh, evolutionary algorithm. You know how this goes. This is what it comes up with at the end. So we finished the first evolutionary algorithm. We're now finishing the second evolutionary algorithm. Second evolutionary algorithm says this. This neural controller, if you drop it into the physical robot, I predict this is what's going to happen. You're going to complete the mission. You're going to successfully walk from the left side of the table to the right side of the table. I see some of you smiling, which is a good sign. You're all becoming good skeptical roboticists. You respect the gap. Mind the gap. OK, what happens? It's not perfect. There's definite differences. It works. OK, we crossed the gap. So the reason we're talking about this project is because of this part, right? This is a way to cross the reality gap by tuning the simu automatically tuning the simulators to be closer to reality. Any questions at this point? OK. However, we're being paid by NASA, so we can't finish here. We need to continue this experiment on to what NASA actually carries, cares about, which is methods of last resort. So we sent the grad student who worked on this project, Victor, we sent him in with a screwdriver, and he mechanically separated the robot's uh, front lower leg did not remove the wiring. So you're inside the box. You still have your eight levers. From your perspective, nothing has changed. From time to time, this particular robot carries out some of those 16 actions that it performed during the first evolutionary algorithm. When this robot rotated motor seven down before, it rotated 10 degrees to the left. But now, when the robot repeats that action, it rotates motor seven down, it rotates five degrees to the left. It performs the same action, but gets a different sensory result. What does the robot do at this point? Uh, maybe like relearn how to walk or something. It's got to relearn how to walk, but why does it bother relearning how to walk? It already knows how to walk. Its body plan has changed. Maybe, maybe it's lost a part. Maybe it's stuck its foot into mud or regolith or you know, who knows what's out there. Maybe it's walked onto the surface of a crater and its environment has changed. This robot has no camera, it can't tell. So something has changed, either I've changed, 
or the world has changed. In this first experiment, we cheated. We told the robot, we said, your environment never changes. You're always walking across an acrylic sheet put on a workbench. So it knows that its environment hasn't changed, so its body must have changed. So it goes back to the first evolutionary algorithm, the one in which it thinks that it's a four-legged robot, the first evolutionary algorithm that's evolving virtual robots. And it, of those 16 actions, it takes the action in which motor seven rotated down and replaces it with this new data. It says, now when I rotate motor seven down, I got this result. So it's got 15 of the original pieces of data and the 16th is one new piece of data. What do you think happens to the fitness of all the virtual quadrupeds at this point? They all drop. What do we do? Just start running the first evolutionary algorithm again. You'll see when this video repeats in a moment, the robot starts with the quadrupedal description there. And that quadrupedal description is the one that suffered a drop in fitness. So it's rapidly bred out of the population and replaced with some of these. I see some of you squinting in confusion. What's going on here? I haven't given you many details about this evolutionary algorithm. I just told you that it's evolving populations of virtual robots. We've got a whole bunch of different mutation operators in here, some of which add and remove parts. They disconnect parts and connect them together in new ways. And some of the mutation operators shrink or enlarge some of the parts. Why the heck would we include those kinds of mutation operators? You'll notice that the robot actually briefly entertains the notion that it's got a shrunken front leg, which actually gets kind of high fitness. That's why it showed up briefly in this video. Every, every model that you see here is explaining 15, 15 and a half, 16 of the actions. Some of these crazy ideas are actually doing a pretty good job. Why? I feel like you'll, you needed that originally because when we only, it only didn't know like how it was, it's made up. It had no like relative way to know what parts were bigger than others, so. Uh, that's true, it doesn't actually, we also didn't tell it how big these parts are. It's also trying to estimate that. I kind of glossed over that detail. It also turns out it's helpful when the robot loses a part. At least it's helpful temporarily and it's rapidly replaced with a more accurate description. Actually, the correct description, which is that it's now a three and a half legged robot rather than a four legged robot. You crash into the surface of an extraplanetary body or you bounce down on the surface a little bit faster than you should have. Part of one of your legs or a wheel breaks off some of the metal shears and your leg is slightly bent. You step in some wet material, sand, grit, regolith, and now you start carrying a little bit of that material on your leg. It turns out that shrinking and increasing the size of objects, although physically impossible in the real world, at least with robots that are made out of metal, that's impossible, it actually ends up estimating or approximating a wide range of things that can actually happen. We didn't want to put particle physics into this physics engine. That's very computationally inefficient, but a lot of the rovers that NASA cares about are going to move over particulate matter, sand, clays, all those kinds of things. It turns out we don't need to simulate all that. The robot can come up with a pretty good explanation of itself, even if that internal description or model is a little crazy, doesn't actually make sense. When we published this paper in Science back in 2006, in, the, in next week's issue, there was a response to this paper from a dream psychologist. Said, this is what we in the dream community have been saying all along. There's a reason why you have crazy dreams. 
That's your brain trying to fit your experiences and the way you interaction, interact with the world, trying to come up with a better description of what you are and aren't capable of, what others are and aren't capable of. And one path to get to the right explanation or a good explanation is often through crazy land, through things that can't possibly be true in reality, but they make a strange kind of sense, right? I imagine you've all had this experience. You wake up in the morning, you're like, wow, that was such a crazy dream. But actually, there were parts of it that were metaphorical, or they kind of led me to a more literal understanding of what happened last week. Who knows, right? This is evolutionary robotics. But at least for the dream psychology community, they found this kind of interesting. It might provide an idea for the adaptive advantage of dreaming. Who knows? There you go. OK. All right, for our back to our back to reality, actually not back to reality yet. We're still in simulation. So the robot says, "Aha, now I know that I'm a three and a half legged robot. What do I do now? What's the next step in the experiment? What do we do? What does the robot do? It's got to try and walk. So it takes that neural controller that caused the four-legged robot to walk, takes that evolved controller, and reruns it on the three-and-a-half-legged robot. What do you think happens? Fitness is going to drop in the second evolutionary algorithm where we're evolving neural controllers. All those neural controllers drop in fitness because they were all good at controlling a four-legged robot. They're probably terrible at controlling a three-and-a-half-legged robot. So we run that second evolutionary algorithm. We keep it going. And this neural controller evolves. You can go back and compare these, but this neural controller causes the three-legged robot to move in a very different way than the four-legged robot does. What's going on? It's limping, all right. The mission is to move from the left side of the table to the right side of the table. How are we doing? It does it, right? Maybe perversely. It does it by walking in a semicircle so that when it ends, it's facing backwards. Although this is a radially symmetric robot, so maybe there is no backwards. Maybe it's not perverse. We didn't say anything about how it should move from left to right, just that it should move from left to right. For those of you that are evolving quadrupeds at the moment, you probably got things as crazy, if not crazier, than this. OK, it works. What do we do? We take this evolved controller and run it on, ah, sorry, on our physical three and a half legged robot. And we've just rescued several million of US taxpayer dollars from being flushed down the drain. It's able to, this robot at this point has diagnosed what's gone wrong. It's got diagnosed what's gone wrong. It's come up with an accurate description of itself. It knows it's lost half of its front leg. And it's come up with a way to recover without the help of mission control. Because mission control also has no idea what's going on. OK. We've got uh, one minute left. So let me just set the stage for next time. What we just talked about was bouncing back and forth between the estimation algorithm, which is trying to estimate the state or the makeup of the robot's body, and the exploitation algorithm, which is trying to exploit the best evolved simulator so far to get the robot to do whatever it is we want it to do. How did the robot actually choose these 16 actions? I didn't actually tell you how it came up with these 16 things to try. I will tell you, it didn't come up with random ideas. It used a third evolutionary algorithm to evolve these 16 actions. 
We'll talk about that next time. You have a quiz due tonight. You are now working on your first weekly report. See you all on Thursday.